that, you know, the COVID-19 crisis really spotlighted um, a lot of the shortcomings of our health system. And I think it gives us an, an opportunity to really intervene and improve things. And I think, you know, particularly we knew who was most vulnerable, you know, people with chronic disease, um, much of it preventable. We saw the disparities and we saw where our health system just frankly didn't work as well as it should have. So I think it really um, highlighted, I think the importance of the, a lot of the work that ARC does to really improve the health system, to get evidence to the point of care, and ultimately goal of improving, you know, optimizing the health of individuals and their communities and families. What do you think people's needs are right now, given the state of where we're at coming, you know, hopefully slowly coming out of COVID, but experience the adverse outcomes that'll follow for quite some time. It was an opportunity for us to learn how to do living reviews. You know, how do you keep um, evidence current? How do you link evidence to clinical decision support? So I think a lot of the advances um, that we did during the pandemic are really gonna inform our work going forward. Um, I really do think we learned, you know, that most of the people admitted who had serious illness um, from COVID had um, multiple chronic conditions um, and the sort of the need for patient-centered care. How do we, you know, reduce, you know, risk in people who are high risk and how do we really um, develop care plans to optimize their health that takes into account all of their conditions, as well as, you know, their social context, which we, you know, know now is really important. I think also we need new models of care. Um, we realized that primary care was not, um, could have done a lot more during the pandemic and wasn't tapped to the extent that it could have, but how do we, you know, fully integrate primary care into um, both, you know, the bigger health system as well as um, public health and communities, and how do we make tr you know transitions between these sectors um, seamless? And I think the other thing is that we need two kinds of evidence. Um, we need the clinical evidence, right? And we also need the evidence for how do we organize and deliver care, and how do we implement the evidence? It takes about 17 years to translate findings from practice into real world clinical settings to improve, really see the improvements in practice. What do you see that we can do more to help with this rapid, more rapid translation of our evidence into clinical practice? Oh, that's critical. I mean, that's and something that we're working on in a couple of ways. How do we make it easy for people to get the evidence they need at the point of care and understand how to use it? And then the other part is we need to know how to implement. So what ARC is doing, you know, we have a large uh, dissemination and implementation portfolio is really integrating quality improvement with implementation science. So we could continue learning. How do we implement better? How do we make sure people are getting, how do we prioritize, you know, what are the interventions that people need and then develop the strategies to accelerate the uptake? That is so key. So our full National Institute for Evidence-Based Practice at Ohio State, we are working with hospitals, healthcare systems, all throughout the United States on, and globe on how to speed that translation of evidence into practice. And I think you made such a fabulous point when you said, Arlene, we've got to make it easy for people because we get bombarded during the course of a day with so much information that it's tough for the practicing person, especially at the bedside, to really synthesize and gather this all and then take action. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's also we need to do the research and development differently. We're very interested in partnership research. 
and user-centered design. So that we need to make sure that the people on the front line are involved in developing the solutions that will work for them. And we also need to focus on workflow. How do we you know, develop you know, workflows that make sense and make it, again, I'm just repeating myself, but easy for people to do the right thing. We have a mental health pandemic inside of the COVID-19 pandemic. What is your perspective on clinician burnout, mental health right now? Yeah, so you know that um, ARC has funded a lot of the foundational work on clinician burnout. And you also know, you know, the quadruple aim, you know, um, includes, you know, physician and clinician wellness. And now it's been expanded to the uh, quintuple aim, which is adding in equity. I think there's two ways of dealing with burnout. One is on the individual you know, level and you know, giving people tools for stress management and dealing with trauma. And that, I'm not gonna say that that's not important, but it's necessary, but not sufficient. And we really need to develop, design workplaces to minimize burnout. And we need to appreciate and value the work that people do. And we need to create supportive teams. And I always tell C-suites across the country, you got to fix system issues. Because if you've got serious system issues, you can offer all the evidence-based programming that you want. And it's probably not going to help all that much until you fix these system issues and culture issues. Well, I want to thank you for your fantastic leadership, your center, all of its fantastic work. We really appreciate it and know that we look to your center to help us implement best evidence and practice to improve outcomes. Thanks so much for being with me today. Much appreciated. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's been wonderful.